Good morning, everyone. Go ahead and find your seats. If you're at home, go ahead and do all you can to get your attention up to the Lord. We're going to sing to him. To worship him, to extol him, to look to him as our all. So let's lift our voices.
give me a passion to see your glory a heart that worships you alone cleanse me forgive me for myself see
Colossians 3 says this, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This next song we're going to sing just is a, a verse after verse of the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus. So let's sing these things and remember just how good it is to be, be have, have, have been bought by Christ and have him as ours. Let's sing this together. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Sing verse 2. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. Christ in God. It's in verse 3. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. Yes, it has. For Jesus led and suffered for. follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hope my hope is only Jesus only him. I hold my hope is only in Jesus 
Before my life is wholly bound to his Oh, how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me Yet not I, but through Christ in me
fix our eyes on your glory. Help us to remind ourselves of your worth. You're King of kings and Lord of lords. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you glory. I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy. praise to be a sweet sound in your ear. When we gather every Sunday, Lord, we want to lift voices of faith to you. And we want those voices to be sounds that are sounds that are sweet to your ear, Lord. Lord, but as we live each day, the rest of the week, Lord, we are given the opportunity every moment of the day to sing a song to you. And maybe it's not a song with an actual melody, but it's a song of worth, a song of praise, a song giving and ascribing glory to you. Lord, we want to, we want to grow in our ability and our worship of you in everyday life, Lord, to see all of life, even in the, the darkness, even in the confusion of life. But we want to be people who are giving you glory, who are raising an anthem to you, when people look on our lives and they, they see how we process life, they see how we decide to do things, they, what they, they hear is a song. They hear a song rising to a Savior. Lord, so make us, make us people who, who have this song on our lips more and more every day. The song that Jesus is better than everything. All we have is Christ, that he's high above all things. Make this our song, Lord, we pray. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Eric and worship team. Well, good morning, church. It is a joy to be with you this Sunday morning. Good morning to those here. Good morning to those in room 200 and those who uh, are in their homes uh, enjoying the rainy day. Uh, my name is Ron. I'm one of the pastors here at Lakeview. And um, as we go into this time of collecting our tithes and our offerings, um, we want to continually use these moments in our worship services to, to, um, to shape our hearts, to make connections with the truth of Scripture and how it works itself out in what we do in our gatherings here, but in our lives as well. Uh, let me read to you a passage in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In the past several weeks, Pastor Keith has been taking us through 1 Corinthians 13, and we have um, been uh, richly blessed by the truth of the biblical definition of what is God and how, uh, what is love and how God has defined love. And uh, last week's sermon was just particularly rich. It was challenging. It was a strong word in our present cultural moment because it featured this idea of dying. Pastor Keith titled his sermon, Dying to Love. 
a very, a very counter-cultural idea. And you know, the, the great irony of our present cultural moment, uh, a culture that, that wants to live in the concept of love, wants to use the concept of love, wants to present the concept of love or their concept of love for everything they do. The great irony, though, is that in culture's passionate pursuit to show love to the individual, it has sought to do that at the expense of community. It has sought to do that at the expense of other people. So in the pursuit of showing love to one individual, it winds up showing the opposite of love to others. It looks like this. You say something that challenges one individual and you're shouted down. You're screamed at. You do something to that individual or you try and connect and engage with that individual in a way that challenges an idea or a way of life and you're canceled. You, you are thrown out of society. You don't belong. That's the loving thing to do. Why is that? Well, I think because today's culture has created for itself a golden calf, an idol. It's created for itself a false god, the idol of self. And it has elevated this idol to heights not yet seen. And the sacrifices that the idol of self requires are anything that falls into the category of the interest of others. So the interest of others are the sacrifices that are brought to this idol of self. But you see, that is not who we are as God's people. That is not what God has called us to be in this community. The gospel of Christ makes us counter cultural people in that, as we were taught yes, last week, we die to self. We die to ourself, to our interests, to our way of life for the purposes of God, but for the benefit of the people that God has called us to. And so what we're doing right now, this moment of giving and tithes is actually a incredibly countercultural moment. The act of giving and tithing is a direct assault against the influences of the idol of self. Why would I say that? Because giving is quite literally a denying of oneself and one's own interest for the glory of God and for the benefit of the local church and its people. We were encouraged last week that love looks like dying. In order to love, we must die. And that looks a whole bunch of different ways. But here is one way that that looks like. It looks like taking our resources, our time, our finances, and joyfully entrusting them to the purposes of God and to the purposes of his church and his people above and beyond our purposes and our self-interest. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you have called us to be and to do. Lord, you have called us to be a people who love you and love each other. Father, and, and thank you for spelling that out for us, Lord. Thank you for not giving us just the instruction to love you and love each other and letting us figure out what that looks like, Lord, but guiding us, Lord, giving us the wisdom of your word that equips us, O oh Lord, to, 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 to works unto salvation and to know how to do that which you've called us to, Father. Bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So church, there's a number of different ways you can give. If you are here in the building, you could take advantage of the offering boxes at the back. Uh, certainly, uh, you can give online through our church app, through, uh, through your bank, through bill pay, and a, a number of different means. Um, just one quick announcement for you guys before Pastor Keith comes up and, pray, and, and preaches and prays. Um, is um, We uh, are looking for help uh, in our AV um, booth back there. So COVID has just forced us to expand uh, different... Um, uh, means and, and ways in which we can get uh, ministry to you through technology. And as you have seen, the booth has, uh, back there has grown in size and, and we need folks to help come with us and partner with us. And, and so uh, I've actually heard from an, a number of you that are interested in serving in, in, in the booth. We've got two open positions, actually three open positions that we're interested in helping. Well, one of those involves everything that's projected in the back, uh, all song lyrics, uh, 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 sermon 
different slides and, and, and whatnot. Uh, that pro presenter person and then uh, the wirecast person is the second position. So if you've benefited from whether it's um, Sunday morning streaming or youth streaming or, or VBS streaming or anything that's streamed uh, through YouTube, our app, uh, there's a person behind a computer back there that's doing all that. And then there's actually one recent addition to the serving opportunities in the sound booth. It's, the, it's what we're calling the CCD. It's the Cox Complaining Department. So th this position is the person who will be on the phone every Sunday calling Cox nonstop and complaining to them as to why they, uh, uh, I guess, forgot they are our internet provider and just seem to not be doing uh, their end of the deal. So uh, that's really not a position, uh, but it may be. I don't know. So um, having said all that, Pastor Keith, would you come up here, please, and give us the word? Finally, somebody identified my gift. And there's an opportunity for the gift of complaining. Finally. <laughs> I can sit on the phone for hours. I can do that really well. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, great to see you guys again this morning. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, if we could at least steal you for a few seconds just to catch up uh, on your way out today, that would be our delight just to hug you from a distance, maybe give you a high elbow, something just to get a chance to be around you a little bit more. Um, all right, if you don't have notes, we do have notes provided for you guys. If you have an app and you want to turn there to the notes today, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Before I read the passage, uh, just highlight something that I think God is, is seeking to give us some grace to be able to receive the valuable, precious gifts that God has placed in our lives that require a certain type of love to hold them, to allow them to function in our lives. And, and if this aspect of the love of God gets displaced in us, then there are precious gifts that become part of the rearview mirror in our lives. They are relationships that we used to have. They are settings that used to be enjoyable, embraced by us. Uh, God has designed love, titled the message today, Love is Not a Sprint, it's an Endurance Race. And there are aspects of love that feel more like a sprint that are just more attractive, right? You know, friendships that just start off with a bang and they're so great and, you know, attending a church and everything just feels like it's great and, and getting married, finding somebody to fall in love with, you know, that's kind of a sprint aspect of love. In that initial moment, that initial discovery, you know, we kind of get addicted, we can't get enough, we're there all the time, we're always seeking that thing out. But at some point, you will know that there are dimensions to walking in those settings and with people in love that's more like an endurance race. It, it begins to offer other opportunities besides euphoric motivation in them. And that's no less love. And with that kind of love that is active in our lives, these precious gifts remain in our lives. And without that, we lose them. So let's pray just for a moment and, and we'll look at this passage together today. Lord, the thing about moving on from people, from settings, is sometimes we don't even think about those things anymore. Or maybe we're here today and there are historic relationships in each of our lives that meant so much to us at one moment. They were so influential. They were such a gift from you. They were shaping our lives. They were helping us. They were a strength to us. But then days and seasons and difficulties came. Sin perhaps came. And loving got hard. And distance ensued and self-protection and moving away from one another. So Lord, maybe some of us here today look in the rearview mirror. Maybe there's a marriage that 
never took place. Maybe there's a marriage that ended because love couldn't find a way to endure. Maybe there are wonderful relationships that we remember, friendships that you brought to our lives. Maybe our extended family, maybe churches that we have been a part of that today, Lord, we we look back on them. They, They don't function today. They perhaps don't exist in real space and time for us anymore. There was love in that setting, but love did not endure. And so, Lord, you want to give us places and people in our lives where love endures. So, God, would you open our eyes, let us see the richness of what you call love, how we might receive that and exchange that in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we have been looking at Paul's expanded definition of love, pulling it out of whatever brief definition we're bringing to this thing and letting it speak with richness, right? So let's look in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And here's where I want us to land today, verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So this is a powerful, wonderful verse that we need in our lives. But let me ask you two questions because I'm not going to teach on these points, but I just want to point out something that's obvious in this. Does love, when you read that passage, right, does love never push back? Love bears all things. Does does love always going to be in the posture where it just gets rolled over? When I read that verse... Is that when I walk away thinking, well, love just bears all the, love just kind of puts up with it, you know, so just get rolled over and then get rolled over again and then just get rolled over again because that's just what love does. Love just gets rolled over, over and over and over again. And love believes and hopes all things that just, so is love like this super naive thing? Like when it has an exchange, it just kind of says, well, okay, well, Okay. If you say so. All right, so is that what this passage is trying to teach us? I remember in this, and I don't want to overlook these little key factors on how we read our Bibles. But remember, the Bible's not designed to try and tuck everything of a revelation in particular areas into one place. That's not how the Bible's designed. All right, so when you're reading one passage, you shouldn't be able to conclude everything about that issue from that one passage. You're going to need the help of other passages here. So when you go to put on and deal with the feel of this passage, this, this sort of, hey, yeah, just roll over me and just I'm going to be totally naive. And whatever you say, I'm just going to believe it because that's what love does. Uh, do you have any examples and any modeling of love and any teaching on love that would contradict that? Well, yeah, right? You should have a lot, right? When Jesus shows up on planet earth, he is the incarnation of love. God is love. When Jesus shows up in human form, there's, there's not a moment you can point out that that, well, you know, he was love until he got to that moment. And then when he did that thing right there, that wasn't love right there. So there are moments where Jesus interacts with situations and people where love doesn't look like it's getting rolled over and it doesn't look naive, right? When the Pharisees came to him and they had their lines of questioning and they were attacking and they were trying to undermine him, uh, there were moments where Jesus res- responded to that presentation by calling them a brood of vipers. Now, maybe that doesn't feel like love, but the incarnation of love is always acting in love, right? There are Moments in which Jesus, in his love and his passion, is knocking tables over and turning things upside down in the temple. 
the incarnation of love is still expressing and motivated by love. The Apostle Paul, when he gets to this point in 1 Corinthians 13 and teaches on love, the consistency of Paul's life, you know, what, what does Paul teach elsewhere? What does Paul represent? Well, even just in this book, we have benefited from just backing up a little bit before Paul said this statement. What other things did he say? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there is this individual who is in the community of God, who is harming the testimony of Christ through sexual relations with his stepmother. How does love engage that moment? Well, the Apostle Paul is going to teach love believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things, is in that moment going to tell them to put that guy out of the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is incensed that the rich people in the church show up early for church, bring the excellent food, eat in the dining hall of the wonderful home that they're meeting in. But then the poor people show up later and don't get welcomed into the dining hall. They they eat in the atrium and they don't get to eat the really good quality food because it's all gone. They get to eat, you know, beanie weenies or whatever everybody else brought for, for dinner that night. And Paul responds to that, right? He, he is not pleasant in that moment. So when we stare into this reality of love is these descriptives, right? Love is, bears all things and believes all things and it hopes all things and it endures all things. Um, there's more to love than what's in that one line, right? So I, I put in your outline, I want to make a deal out of this. What does love do when it encounters three sets of situations? I don't know if we have a slide for this or if it's just in your outline, right? I'm, three realities. These are going to be in our settings and love has a response to them. It's not always the same response, All right? So here, here's, here's going to be in your relational settings. Category A, sin, hostility, conflict that is argumentatively attacking. It's going to be in settings that you're called to, that God has placed you in. How does, how does love respond to that? And then in those same settings, there will be deficiencies, weakness, and immaturity. We'll come into that setting and we'll interact with you and you will be affected by that. How does love respond to that? then there will be differences, just two people that are just different, people in a group that are different, difficulties and disagreement. I don't agree with you. But love believes all things, hopes all things, endures. And does that mean I'm obligated to agree with you? Do Do I have to take up your opinion in order for you to feel like I'm loving in that moment? All right, so how does love respond to these things. What kind of, because love we said is an exchange. It's an expression. It's it's in our midst. It's in here with us. Well, among the biblical options that I'm not going to talk about today, love might confront, right? That could be awkward and uncomfortable. Love might correct. The same love that believes all things, hopes all things and endures all things. It might correct something in love. Uh, Love might discipline a situation through a variety of means. But that's not where I'm going today. I want to go in the direction of where these words lead us, right? So I wrote this out in your outline, follow along with me. But in verse seven, love is doing something else that needs to be part of our relational contexts. It is bearing and enduring and putting up with and hanging in there. It is actively believing and hoping and engaging and leaning in. It is not quitting or withdrawing or diminishing or even conditioning its response. It is not annoyed but tolerating nearby, but it's sulking and indifferent or negative. It's not that. You know, and sometimes... The, the, the bringer of God's miraculous involvement in relational settings in people's lives find its, its, its cause and its impact by those who are hanging in there when you've given them no reason to do that. 
but they're going to still be there in your life. They're not going to withdraw. They're not going to go away, even though you've offended them, even though you've given them reason, even though they could explain why they're backing away from you. But you're going to stay and hang in there and lean in. And God's grace is going to find its way into that person, into your world. Through that, love bears things and it believes things. It hopes and it endures things. All right, so let me pick up this concept of love's non-crowding or pressing behavior. Right? Sometimes love just backs off a little bit. It doesn't press force. Right, now, I started this series highlighting this, and I, I want to make sure we, we recognize these things sit in tension, right? So I wrote this out as well in your outline. In a church setting that features sound doctrine and correct believing, love can begin to hang out with rightness. And I take issue with the idea that the, the way of correcting that tension is by just doing away with how important right believing and doctrine are. Let's just downplay that so we can just feel the love, man. Just love each other and let's just pull that back a little. Let's not be so strident about what we believe. Uh, no, the, the Bible is very loud about what we believe. It teaches a lot. Doctrine is not something to play with or to make secondary in the kingdom of God. The world runs on ideas. Eternity awaits the belief of ideas. Heaven and hell are realities based on believing a concept. So doctrine matters, beliefs matter, and yet we can do those doctrines and those beliefs to, to where the rightness, things have got to be right, become the driving force in a way that erodes and undermines relationships and doesn't let these particular words show up very well, right? The thought that if something is wrong, love would want to make it right. If someone begins to stray or shares a thought that is headed out of bounds, then love would want to adjust that. Now beware, this love often feels like control, panic, monitoring, manipulation, correction on steroids. Know anybody like that? Parents can easily fall prey to this. Rightness, we just want to make sure every attitude, every action, every thought, every friend, every setting is right. It's right. right. And we become these forces of pressing and urging and monitoring and manipulating, controlling. Doctrinaires, those of us who are convinced that doctrine matters, can be listening for the slightest variation what you said and what you didn't say. You know, Keith, I heard you say, but you know, you didn't say. Yeah, that's probably true. Not this time, but yeah. There's this sense that, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, when you preach, you got to say it all right. Uh, then there would be no preaching, right? We would not have any preaching in the church. But there is this sense that we just, we've got to say it right. Legalists can fall prey to this. That, that human behavior and approaches and how you, how you behave in the church, in the, li in the world, in society. How those, all those things, how you dress, the words you use, the sound, you know, the places you go. Oh, we, we've got to get all that right. That can be in our settings. Fearful people fall prey to this. If you're fearful, you're, you're just always within one arm's reach of control. You just want to control things because you're afraid of it going wrong. All right, so there's a sense of rightness that can pollute and engage us. And, and part of this, what I just said, part of that's right. Part of that's okay. But this is where Paul kind of allows love to have this full-orbed feel to it by this long definition that he gives to it. 
that he pulls in some other dimensions, that it's, it's okay to bear some things, to endure some things and not to fix them or adjust them. Right, so here, here's some elements in scripture that promote our understanding in this category and don't allow us the option of choosing one or the other. We don't get to choose one aspect or the other. This is a long definition. We've gone through 15 descriptions in this passage. Proverbs 9, uh, probably Proverbs 19, verse 11 says, good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. Did you know sometimes you, you really do get offended? Or the, the word offense is being used there. You really do feel offended. And the Bible does teach about us going to one another and addressing those issues. But did you know the Bible also gives you permission to overlook that offense? 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Above all, keep loving. Right? I love those two words together because they are in this phrase in 1 Corinthians as well. They are the enduring, the ongoingness, the fact that love's not going to quit. Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That word cover gets picked up in a few places. Proverbs 17, verse 9 says, whoever covers an offense, right? So this is a real exchange, a real difficulty. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. Seek love. Sometimes that's what love wants to express, wants to cover that. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Right? How, how do I manage that sense of offense that, that you have done this again to me? You have done something to me. Do I cover that or do I run to a couple of buds and talk it out and separate friends with that? Proverbs 10 verse 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Right? Love has something in it that doesn't mind covering and overlooking something. That word cover means to hide or bury or veil something. It means to put it out of sight, to not be staring at that thing. There's something about love like God's love operating in us that when offenses come, it enables me not to just be captured by that offense and be staring at it. And now that's the only thing. That's the controlling thing. That thing's determining who you are to me now. Love has this ability to bury that thing. And to not stare at it, even though it was real. You don't bury it because it's not real. You don't bury it because it's easy to ignore. You don't bury it because it wasn't an offense. These are offenses that are getting buried. One commentator said of Proverbs 17, it says, How people respond to the faults of others reveals whether or not they have compassion. The contrast here is between he who covers over an offense of a friend and he who repeats the news about it. The former promotes love and the latter alienates friends. Listen, friendship requires the ability to forget. True of all the friendships that have endured in our lives. The true friend buries the wrong done for the sake of love. It values love. It loves the godly dimension of God's character more than it loves making that right. But you do recognize, right? I'm not going to abandon the fact that sometimes we're called to make those things right. Sometimes we should confront that. But sometimes we should bury it. And overlook it. Charles Spurgeon has an interesting thought on this. He says it covers them sometimes by not seeing them. 
For where there is much love, we are blind to many faults, which otherwise we might see. We do not exercise the sharpness of criticism, which malice would be sure to exercise. This is powerful. This is helpful. Where there is much love, we are blind to many faults. Real news for you. Your peeps, your posse, your good friends aren't that much better quality people than others. Just letting you know. The difference is they live in your good graces. You ever heard that phrase, good graces? It's a, it's a disposition that people can get into our good graces somehow. There is a love that we sort of go offense blind over. We, we just stop noticing all those things that they do that are selfish or off-putting or not said the right way, late, untimely, neglectful. We just, we overlook those things. They're there. Oh, they're there. But we don't notice them as much because love makes us blind to these things in so many ways. It's when love diminishes to the place that it begins to, to feel more like a criticism fest, a, a sense of malice can creep in as the word Charles Spurgeon uses to where now I notice and I notice a lot. I notice everything. I'm just working through one offense after another. Good graces. It's a chosen blindness to faults. But something happens, right? This is why this teaching on enduring is so helpful. Something happens along the way in relationships, right? Spouses. How do spouse, spousal relationships move from early on infatuation? No hair ever seems to be out of place for the other person. Breath never stinks. It's just nothing. I don't notice anything. There's just this infatuation and just time marches on and then nitpicking has replaced infatuation. Comments one after the other of why do you do that? How come? You never, you always, right? what has happened here? Like we have lost or diminished an aspect of love that bears things, that endures things. And quite honestly, in the beginning, uh, there was other stuff happening that made us overlook bearing and enduring. We didn't care about bearing or enduring any of that. You, know, you, you get into a family, you marry in, you got in-laws, right? In the beginning, there's effort trying to make that a good relationship, trying to make it work. There's effort there. And, and why does that turn later into avoidance, right? No, no, you can, you can go visit them. I, I got stuff I got to do. So I, I don't want to be around your parents. I want to be in that setting, that sense of enduring, I uh, don't want to endure what they're like. I've uh, been doing that for a long time, kind of worn out by it, right? Um, churches, pastors, we, we can come into a church and have the impression that everything is just so right here. It just, oh, just feels so right. It's taught right. It's led right. The people are right. The setting is right. Everything's so right. And then we fast forward a little ways and we begin to develop a list of deficiencies in the very same setting that we were blind to them before. This, this is something for us to be aware of in the category of rightness and love that endures. I don't know if I wrote this in your outline or not, but we are called in numerous places to confront and correct sin, but you are not prohibited from covering or burying sin and moving on in compassion for another. Some Christians are more like sin accountants than they are friends or brothers and sisters. Every sin has to be focused on, dealt with. Listen, it's okay 
to just bear with something, endure something, overlook something, bury something. The Bible actually lets us do that. There is an aspect of enduring love that needs to be more applauded. It's not this euphoric, romantic chemistry kind of thing. It is love in the long haul that notices there's deficiency, there's difference here, but I, I choose to interact with that with a heart of love. Listen, can I just point out something that uh, I want to applaud and appreciate the individuals and families of color who are part of our church. You know, we, there's a lot of talk these days, rightly so. I think we need to, to figure out how to get farther down the line, line in, in areas of racial reconciliation. Part of that's going to mean we're going to actually get in the same space as black and white and Latino and, and, and do life together. I mean, I, you can avoid each other and claim that you got no problems with each other. I guess you can do that. But the reality is, what, do you, what happens when you actually do life together? Well, if you do life together, and much credit to those of you who are people of color who are in this setting where you'll, you'll notice some of the ideas amongst people who have not experienced what you've experienced, who have not come from where you have come from, who have not seen life through your lens, uh, they don't respond to life the way you do. They don't see the problems that you see. They're not animated over the problems that you're animated over. And in some ways, that can feel alienating. That can feel insensitive. And the fact that you're here testifies that you are willing to overlook certain things. You are willing to endure differences that have to be managed when people aren't exactly like each other, right? If I developed a line equation here for endurance, endurance doesn't kick in until somebody separates and becomes different than you. As long as somebody's just like you, you're not enduring anything. It's not until they get out of line with you, and then the distance can grow and grow in certain categories. That distance between you and them, that's what endurance is. If it's real tight, there ain't much endurance going on. You're still getting your way. You don't have to adjust. You don't have to think different, be different, act different. They're just like you. But the, this, the more they get like this, right? Husbands and wives going to get an amen. The more they get like this, the more it feels like now I'm having to endure something. Oh, man, brother, I've been enduring something for quite a while. Uh, yeah, that's what endurance is. It is dealing with our differences. Listen, the church setting is a setting, this is what Paul's writing into, is a setting that features endurance. Features endurance. Remember, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, trying to help them experience and express the love of God in their midst. So he's trying to pull this into the reality of who they are together with each other. So church in the New Testament way requires a love that features enduring because it's gonna bring together all kinds of different elements. You guys have heard me say this multiple, multiple times. You're probably sick of me saying it. Our culture doesn't do different. It doesn't do different. And more and more so, it's gotten worse. It doesn't do different, right? Two observations for you to notice how this is slipping in under your skin. One, polarization makes sense to people today. To have like nothing in the middle and everything to be polarized at one extreme or the other seems to make sense to people today. That's not always the way life felt, right? You are either, and this just makes sense, the presentation all around us sounds like you are either 100% on board with the Democrats or you are 100% on board with the Republicans. You, either, you just sign on with one group or the other and, and you are in line. Could there be any possibility that somewhere in between these groups are some worthy ideas and approaches to dealing with life and people and problems? Could, could that be possible? Could it be possible to agree with aspects in the extremes and disagree with other aspects without sort of getting attacked by either end? 
You know, I, and you don't hear this either. I don't ever hear that. I don't ever hear those who represent the conservative Republican view and those who represent the liberal progressive uh, Democrat view. I don't ever hear those commentators validate something coming from the other side. Really got no good ideas. They got nothing on the other end over there that makes any sense to human life. No, it just makes sense to polarize us and to only have extreme views in our midst. The world has made it feel like you are either pro-LGBTQ or you hate LGBTQ. That's the only two positions that are available. Is there anything in between those two? Does it make sense to afford people an ability to think in between those spaces? That, that there might be positions where you don't fully agree and support what LGBTQ stands for and is promoting. At the same time, you don't hate them. Something in there. You are either on board with Black Lives Matter or you're a racist. Those are your two options today. So when we talk about issues, what's presented makes you feel like that's what you've got to choose. Is there something in between here? Is there, is there something that says, hey, uh, I definitely am on that end. And I'm not all the way on that end either. But there are some things that I agree with there. And there's a place besides the extremes for us to be able to relate, walk together, endure you're either COVID convinced that the CDC is now rewriting a Bible or you believe there are COVID quacks out there that everybody's fallen in line with. Is there anything in between those two spaces, right? We don't do different. We don't do different. We don't allow people to be shades and variations of whatever our extreme position is. So can you imagine trying to be a church in that setting? In the first century, they had problems. We've got our own set of problems, but please, please pay attention as to whether you find yourself having to be 100% on one end of issues or another, and you won't give yourself permission to say, you know, no, I don't, I don't really agree with him on all that. I think this, and, and you just alienated yourself from both groups. Now, both groups don't like you because you're not on board with anybody. Uh, I think the church better find that place. It better find it soon. Because these are not the issues around which we unify. Here, second reason that endurance is facing challenges is this. Long-term relationships are fading into history. Long-term relationships are fading into history. Let me give you some observations in that category. Timothy Keller wrote a book, The Meaning of Marriage, a few years ago. In the book, he said the divorce rate is nearly twice the rate it was in 1960. In 1970, 89% of all births were to married parents. But today, only 60% are married. Most telling, over 72% of American adults were married in 1960, but only 50% were in 2008. And actually today, for the first time, a few years ago, for the first time in tracking this in history, there are more single adults today than there are married adults today. What does this say? It says long term, I got to hang in there with you. I got to be committed. I got to stay in this thing when I feel like it and when I don't. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want that kind of relationship commitment. I want my options to be open. I, I want the ability to go after life the way in which, and, and if I get yoked to another person, if I get in this long term, I get this committed thing, it's, it's going to slow me up. Yes, it is. And you will have to endure things and put up with things and bear things. And that won't always feel like it's an enjoyable experience. Mobility means that increasing adventure of new relationships awaits us and staying in the same familiar places of relationships can get tired and boring and old. There's much more mobility of life today than there has been ever. 
So when you move and get into new places, relationships start over, right? So you get, I get to go through that introductory phase with you. I just get to know you. We get to have, be infatuated and everybody seems to be great. Endurance is going to take a while before I have to love you in an enduring way. But those people that have been a part of their lives for 10 and 20 and 30 years, <clears throat> we're living in this enduring love a lot. Church community is more associated with consuming content and activities rather than participating or practicing fellowship with a group of different and even difficult people. It's like we can come into this setting and we're here because we want to hear a certain thing today. And I want what you're saying to affect my life so I can pick it up and take it and go do life in the name of God and spirituality. Uh, and, and what do you have for my kids? What kind of programs y'all got around here? And like we become here as consumers, but to get involved with people who look different, act different, have different values, or they have different money than we do, they have different pace of life, they have different ideas than we do, we're going to have a conversation with them. It's like, I don't know that I want to do that, right? Well, that changes the way long-term relationships are done. Some of you guys have been around the body of Christ long enough to know that there, are, there is this narrowing of like-mindedness over the years, that I, you know, I'm a person who thinks doctrine matters, so I don't mind this at some level. All right, so when I first got saved, found out what a church was, back then the phrase that bound us together was, we are a Bible-believing church. That's what we were. Bible-believing church, right? The statement being made by churches was, hey, we're not just going with the latest trend, latest idea. We're not teaching something that's psychology. We're a Bible-believing church. And then you know, narrow that a little bit more. We are spirit-filled church. You know, those who are not, but they're a spirit-filled church. And, and again, these things are important things. Uh, we are grace-oriented church, right? So that was to distinguish the church from the legalists out there who were too much into human behavior and not enough into the grace of God. We are an expository church. So that means that we teach the Bible a particular way and we expound the scriptures rather than teach topically randomly throughout the Bible. We are a gospel-centered church. And then that, you know, that's 20 years ago. And then in the last 20 years, that has become we are a particular aspect of gospel-centered in what we emphasize. Listen, I believe ideas matter. But, you know, when you got that much criteria crowding into human relationships in this setting, it can be a little bit difficult. And I've been rather disappointed in, within our own denomination, right? Sovereign Grace Churches, I've watched pastors and local churches that I had long-term relationships with agree with other churches on the seven shared values that we share on how leadership should be done in churches, what, what doctrine should be featured in primary, et cetera, et cetera. But when a situation arose that was handled this way instead of that way, I don't know if I can stay. And so I watch one church after another depart over those kinds of issues. And what was crushing me in that moment was I'm recognizing this is what our culture is teaching us. We don't do different. And if you get a little bit different from me in certain categories, I can't do it. I don't know what to do with you anymore. But this love bears things. This love in 1 Corinthians 13, it endures things. It pulls off relationships that have longevity and challenge to them. Let me highlight something about, that I think about Lakeview Christian Center in particular. I think this setting, this church, um, actually does enduring love pretty well. All right, when I look around this room, you know, if you're kind of new to the church or been in the last 10 years, you don't realize how many people in this room right now, how many historically that are in the room when we used to be configured a little bit differently, were in this church in the 1980s. A handful of them were in the church in the 1970s. A large portion of our church has been here since the 1990s. Some of them helped plant the church on the North Shore. So they're still together in Jeff's church on the North Shore. That's over 20 years ago. 
of people who have joined their lives together. There's an enduring love in that. You get familiar with this place. I mean, we're just, we're just not all that. Eventually, the, you know, the polish wears off, and you're just kind of left with, okay, so this is it. And 20 and 30 years later, you got people who are still here, committed to each other, walking together, building the kingdom of God. The elders have an enduring love, have been serving together. I've been serving with the elders that are currently elders, except for Evan and Frank, since the late 1980s. Decades of serving together, having to bear things. Right? Can, can you imagine you're a, a group of leaders in a church traveling through a culture, problems coming into people's lives, issues that come up, challenging thoughts, right doctrine. Are we for that or against that? Should we support that or not? Should we do this this way or that way? What's the philosophy in our approach to ministry? That person's got a problem. How should we handle that? No, I don't think we should handle it that way. No, I think we should. Can you imagine 30, 40 years of those conversations and interactions? Can you imagine it's 1997 in Lakeview Christian Center and there is a, a different senior pastor there at that moment who feels like he should not be here any longer. Difference of view, difference of philosophy of ministry. Tried to work through that. He leaves. And at that point, I'm, I'm a 33-year-old, barely 33-year-old youth pastor in the church. And yet the elders are going to give me and Peter more space in leading the church. Can these guys do it? Can Keith do it? I don't know. But let's see. Four months after this other pastor resigns, I turn around to the elders and ask them all to resign. The same group that are elders today, by the way. Now, we just didn't happen to be teaching through 1 Corinthians 13 in that moment. I was about to discover whether love was going to be patient, not take into account a wrong suffered, whether there was going to be a response of love that was willing to put up with some things and endure the immaturity of a 33-year-old who hadn't quite figured enough things out yet. But here we are, decades later, because there was a group of guys who said, you know, uh, we could fire you right now, dude. This could be your last day here. <laughs> but they endured. They allowed me to grow and to mature. And, and so I, I, I give us high marks in that category in many ways. Uh, not because we haven't had to deal through issues. Not because there hasn't been those little three categories of sin conflict that we've had to sort through, our differences and disagreements, or weaknesses and immaturity. That was a great example of, okay, the 33-year-old thinks he's got it all figured out, and this is what needs to go down right now. Um, listen, if we're going to do church together, there is going to be a need for us to endure with one another. Otherwise, it's going to be a sprint. It's not going to be a long race together building the kingdom of God. Right? For you to be a part of Lakeview Christian Center, you're going to have to endure some things. It will feel like enduring at some moment. You will be enduring stylistic elements, right? Maybe you come to this church, and I've talked to folks who've come to the church, and maybe you're just kind of like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really, I'm like a John MacArthur guy. You know, that's, that's, my, that's my man. Or I'm a John Piper guy. Or I'm a Ravi Zacharias guy. Or I'm a Francis Chan guy, right? But, but you, know, you get me most weeks. <laughs> no, listen, I, there is a, there is a acquired taste in this moment, right? Uh, I, you know, I, I am a certain way in certain categories and some of you guys love that. And some of you guys are, I'm like fingernails on a chalkboard sometimes, uh, but there's an enduring element in our walking together 
in a setting. You, you might come into this church and feel like, you know, why does this church do this, doesn't do that? Why is it structured this way? Why don't we do more of this and less of that? Um, those can be very good questions. Those could be not right or wrong issues, just differences, right? And something that you feel very strongly about, we don't do very well or at all. And, and something that we do in prize, you don't see the value of it. But if you're part of a community, you may have to endure, right? Love might have to bear some things and endure some things. Otherwise, it's going to be a short sprint. And I don't think that's what God is after. If you're, if you're going to do marriage today, uh, you're going to have to be okay with enduring. All right, quick perspective on, on marriage. And I know I'm about to run out of time here. Do this last example. Tim Keller says this of marriage. He says, I'm tired of listening to sentimental talks on marriage at weddings and church and in Sunday school. Much of what I've heard on the subject has as much depth as a Hallmark card. While marriage is many things, it is anything but sentimental. Marriage is glorious, but hard. It's a burning joy and strength, and yet it is also blood, sweat, and tears. Humbling defeat and exhausting victories. No marriage I know more than a few weeks old could be described as a fairy tale come true. Sometimes you fall into bed after a long, hard day of trying to understand each other, and you can only sigh. This is all a profound mystery. At times, your marriage seems to be an unsolvable puzzle, a maze in which you feel lost. What are you thinking in that moment if your marriage starts to feel that way? Must have married the wrong person. Can I tell you that's what a lot of people are thinking today? What would make you think that because this has become hard, you married the wrong person? Now, what you're not going to answer when I say that to you is you're not going to quote Tim Keller. You're not going to quote, well, you know, I've noticed that the culture has taught me that if life doesn't go according to my preferences and plan, it, then, then it's not what God wants for me and it's not good. Did you know God wants you to endure? Love endures. He wants you to endure. He wants you to value enduring. Right? So God comes along and says, the, you know, the Bible says love feels like bearing things and enduring things and hoping things. Insert it in a context where, where it doesn't look like I got reasons to hope, but love is going to hope anyway. Uh, the world turns around and says, no, if that's what your love feels like, you have fallen out of love. You do recognize that, right? If your love in your marriage feels like 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7, where you got to bear things, hope things that kind of aren't here right now, and endure things, then you have fallen out of love, man. We just fell out of love. I don't know. We just, just happened. It just, that's not a biblical view of what love looks and feels like. I need this category. I need an enduring love. I need to value the fact that sometimes relationships that are in my life are going to require a love like God's to be activated in me by the Spirit that is going to be able to endure these kinds of places. It's true for the church. It's true for your marriage. It's true for your family for years and years to come as to whether they will have a relationship or not once they all move out of the house and get on their own. So let's do that. I want us to pray together. Eric, you can come back up. Skip the end of the message there. All right, at the end of your message, you guys can maybe dial these passages into your thoughts. Did you know the Bible doesn't present endurance, that word endurance, that concept of things enduring. It doesn't present that like a booby prize, like a bad thing. Like if you got to do that, well, you know, good luck. Um, 
it actually presents it as though it's an important thing, a valuable thing. It brings a quality to your faith. It produces character in your life. It opens the door to many, many things in the grace of God. So there are things about God that God wants us to experience. He wants us to have this, this, but endurance is like a doorway. If you look in the passages that I've provided, you'll notice that endurance gets mentioned on the front end. And then after that comes all these other things, which raises the question, what if I don't want to do endurance? Well, then you're probably not going to get to the other things either because that's where you start. And so there are dimensions to being a church together. There are dimensions to being in friendships together. There are dimensions to being in marriages together that when the enduring love kicks in, it brings us into a maturity and an experience that we never could have had if we weren't willing to do that. But all around the landscape of enduring love is difference and difficulty and disagreement and immaturity and weakness and maybe even sin or offense that might need to be overlooked or buried so that we can continue in compassion with each other. All right, here's what I want us to pray about this morning. I want to pray for you. I want you to be able to be honest in where you are. I want, I want, I hope, hopefully this is an accurate biblical insight into what God's view of love operating in us is like. But if you are finding yourself absent of this, this kind of love isn't in your marriage. It's not in your family relationships. There's too much in your rearview mirror that was jettisoned because love couldn't endure what happened, what repeatedly happened, what occasionally happened. Might God want to download something of a revelation and an empowerment for that to be different? The Bible is going to come right out and say, you have need of endurance. Maybe that's what your marriage needs. An enduring love. Maybe that's what your church needs. An enduring love. Let's stand up together. Lord, it's not a new thought that as we set out on these journeys of life that in our own strength, our own power, we get in over our head right away. It's a little staggering to observe. But it doesn't take generations and generations before Cain kills Abel. first family. Lord, we just get in places where this fallen, broken world becomes confusing, threatening, disorienting. And Lord, to spare ourselves, we could become murderous or at least break with relationships. Lord, but I don't think you are eager for the people of God to tell the same story about our abilities to be in love when love is just a short sprint, when love is easy, when love is naive, when love hasn't had real disappointments and real challenges. What credit is it to you, you said, if you love those who love you? Don't even the Gentiles do that. So Lord, you must have an idea that love is much bigger than the little narrow spaces, the little closet that we keep it in. You have this adventure for us to be on with one another where we grow old together, 
husbands and wives or families. Stay connected. Love endures. Churches are filled with people who remember way back when. Lord, it's going to take a miracle from you. This seems so far from us now. This seems almost confusing. It just doesn't even feel right. But love bears things. And love believes things. And love hopes things. And love endures things. And you are love, Lord. This is where we get our idea from love. You. You have bore things. You have believed things. Hoped things. You have endured things. You, oh God, you are love. Lord, make us in your image. I want to pray right now. I pray for husbands and wives in this room right now. I pray for some who are here and the sweetness of the journey together has just been absent. This doesn't feel sweet. They, they are withdrawn. They are self-protective. They are living in the same space, but at a distance. They don't engage. They don't take a chance. God, would you bring light into that space, however dark it's become? God, would you bring power and willingness? To, would you be the God who's at work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure? What I believe it's your good pleasure that love endures can go a long way together and be patient and overlook offenses and find yet again sweetness. God, I pray that for couples here this morning. Sweetness would return. Joy and pursuit of each other would return. Lord. Healing, Lord, would come. I pray for us as a church in a polarized culture that feels like it won't embrace you unless you come all the way over here to me. Forces disingenuineness because you can't be open and honest and be accepted. Oh God, would you rescue us from that? Would you let not the tone and the approach and the infection of the world around us creep into our love for one another? God, will we be a people in these secondary issues, these non-gospel issues, that we don't stand entrenched, refusing to love another person unless they 100% come into agreement with me? God, that's not who we are. God, make us a people who we're aware that the people in this place have put up with us, have endured us, have not taken into account a wrong or neglect or a moment of selfishness or an offense or that we would know what it is to be in a setting where offenses get buried and not stared at. We are eager to engage one another in a love that endures and bears and hopes and believes. Well, that's that's an incredible environment, Lord. It sounds like some dream, but it's your description of the church. It's something we can be and we long to be. So, Father, here are our lives with all the challenges and brokenness we bring. God, would you invade our love in the spaces that you've given us precious gifts? Would you invade those places, Lord? Enable and empower us to bear things, to endure things, to keep going and not quit. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Are, are, are we uh, broadcasting anything? We are. All right. Glad you guys were able to join us today. We miss you. It's raining outside. Tough day to be here. Grateful for the folks who endured the rain. Hope to see you soon. Uh, if not, we'll see you online next week.